So uh, let's uh, quickly go through our agenda. So we'll uh, start by just briefly covering what is machine learning and why there is so much excitement now, how it relates to other workloads, how it is meaning similar yet different from other workloads, and then we do most of our bulk of our talk will be a deep dive on the core machine learning functions, and uh, then. I'll give you a preview of our upcoming enhancements to our product roadmap as well as architecture toolchain and then summarize. So uh, what is machine learning? Let's uh, start on a lighter note first and uh, nothing uh, puts you in a lighter note uh, uh, um, uh, than Dilbert's cartoon. So we'll start on a light note, uh, like I said, Dilbert's cartoon. So th this is what Dilbert had to say. Observing your browsing habits, for example, a machine, your computer may one day tell you, oh, looks like you have uh, interest in extreme sports. And not just that, but go on to recommend that, can I interest you in buying a, a ticket from a base jump from an international space station? And you begin to wonder, <clears throat> is, is the whole world, internet world, like conspiring to kill me? And then Dilbert sums up, now, that's exactly what machine learning is. Machines trying to look smart, trying to reason for you on behalf of you, human-like. So now let's uh, uh, get a little more serious. Uh, on a more technical note, machine learning is probably being most concisely and precisely defined by none other than the famous Professor Tom Mitchell at CMU, who simply called it a, as a, com a computer program where performance improves over time with experience. So it's almost like imagine a program, imagine making a computer almost like a wine. It gets better as it ages. It doesn't happen typically, right? I know, my laptop, <laughs> yes. But imagine the day when you actually have a program that actually learns and gets better over time, just like we all do, right? Most of us. So uh, some more details, right? You generally start in all these cases uh, with uh, model building, right? So in that training phase, all that matters is the time to train a model to good enough accuracy. And once you have done that, then all that matters, you enter a different phase when you're applying that model in real time for classifying documents or images. And in that phase, apply phase, all that matters is the efficiency of the throughput, the throughput of that processing, documents per second, images per second, or the efficiency of the processing, images per second per watt, for example. So the training phase is very different from the actual application phase or classification or scoring phase. So uh, moving on, there are three types of machine learning at a high level. The one that most people, most common form is called supervised learning. And supervised learning is mostly when you have a large amount of training data to help you out with the training phase. Remember the training phase being the most complex phase. So how do we make it easier? We have humans like Amazon Turk sometimes actually labeling the data very painfully such that machine can be trained to reasonable accuracy, right? So the application phase has meaningful output. If the model is garbage, garbage and garbage out. So you need to train the model to a reasonable level of accuracy. That, in this case, happens with help of supervised label data. The, what we really want is not this, because if the humans labeling, it will always be slow, right? So what you ideally want is unsupervised machine learning, unsupervised learning where machines on their own, without any intervention or help from humans, can learn and get better and better over time. It's definitely the most desired and if you could really do this, this is all we'll be doing, right? But since we can't always do this, what we <coughs> land up doing today most of the time is supervised learning and knowing very well that the real thing, real target is unsupervised learning. And then for, I'll also mention a third form of learning, namely uh, uh, reinforcement learning, where uh, it's something in between, it's a little different. The machine is given an explicit notion of a reward function, something that when you do right, like uh, playing a game, you get rewarded positively. If you do something wrong, you get rewarded negatively. You get penalized. So, and that all, and it's observing actions, doing things throughout to optimize that reward function. So, in this talk, we'll mostly be covering the first two types of machine learning and not the third one. Okay. So now, uh, let's again, let's now look at spend a couple of files to get a feel for why now question, right? After all, machine learning is not new; it's decades old. So, why this sudden interest in it now? And you can see this is uh, uh, from these press, press clips that machine learning is all over the press, right? It's, it shouldn't surprise us simply because it's at the heart of uh, our dreams, our dream machine. A machine that can actually reason just like, a, just like we do. Not just a number cruncher, but actually a decision maker, right? A machine that can actually de re uh, uh, make decisions like we humans do. So that's really what's ultimately uh, uh, after. And therefore, it's definitely exciting, right? From uh, um, hoping machines can cook someday, find us uh, dating partners, find us uh, um, 
uh, terrorists, whatever, right? Anomalous heartbeats before it breaks down, all those things, right? All those good things. Therefore, it's uh, it's easy to see that yes, there is serious excitement here, right? But what is really different? I mean, this wish has not been it's an old wish. It's not a new uh, uh, wish. What's really different now is the availability of huge amount of data. And remember, we need data. Why do we need data? We need data to train. That's how the machine gets trained. Label or not, we need data to begin with, right? This, the amount of data needed to train machines to reasonable accuracy has not been around so far. Therefore, even though theory was around, it wasn't practice, practic, practically useful. So now, the data is not just there in, in abundance. Uh, it's, it's, it's already there because you and I are uploading it. But again, if humans are uploading, it's never be too uh, uh, fast enough and, 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 and big enough. What's really going to happen very soon, without any human intervention, data will be uploaded around the clock by these not just smart devices that we hold, but the things around us, right? That 24-7 uploading of data, which hasn't even begun yet, will completely dwarf where we are, not just zettabytes, well beyond that. And that's the power of machine learning. That huge amount of data can actually train and help us solve problems which were so far completely out of reach. So that's really why there's so much excitement to be able to derive and extract values in real time so that we can proactively address and see things and create highly efficient solutions for a large application sectors of society which are completely untouched by computing today. Health, education, infrastructure, transportation, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Farming. So that's what really the promise of machine learning is and hence the excitement about machine learning. So now moving on. Now if it's really... Uh, is it really that different? Meaning if it's about decision making and not number crunching, are we ultimately talking about a computer that's very different? Not the kind we built today, not the kind we use today? Simple answer is no, right? Now, it's it's uh, machine learning has its own characteristics, yes, but in many ways it's very similar. In fact, it's very similar to a first order, it's very similar to high performance computing. Not what it has been, but where it's headed. So these two workloads, high performance computing and machine learning, at least, how they're evolving, where they're projected to go, they share more and more similarities. And so let's get to a deeper feel for why that is the case. So here's uh, one way to look at this, right? Most of the traditional problems that we have been solving so far, I call them inside out. Why? Because there's a nice set of equations given by some god, Einstein, Newton, whoever, and we solve those equations, right? And we predict, we predict system behaviors by solving these complex equations, therefore we keep asking for more and more flops, right? That's inside out. What machine learning is about is quote-unquote outside in, meaning think of problems where we have not been lucky enough to have these uh, Einstein no, uh, and, and, and Navier Stokes, the 99% of problems are of those types, right? So for those problems, we just basically have a black box. We don't know any such equations. So we're going, coming outside in from large amount of input-output data, we're trying to reverse engineer what's inside. These reverse problems are fundamentally hard. They are harder in complexity than typical uh, forward problems. So, but the good, the important thing is to, to note is that we don't just do this. Ultimately, whatever black box model you come up with, neural network model, for example, to validate that mo validate that model, you still have to go and do forward pass, the inside out pass. So that's the whole point, right? That you have to do both for machine learning, both forward pass and the backward pass, and that's how you ultimately get to figure something out and build a good enough model. So these two are very related, which also means that they share challenges. The challenges in common. What challenges? Let's understand. I mean, the, the easy part of all these algorithms, both HPC and machine learning, is when you have really nice, dense computations, regular accesses. If that's the case, no problem. We can deliver 90 plus percent efficiency. Our ALEs are super efficient. Our architectures are super efficient. Link back runs at 95, 96 percent efficiency, meaning peak flops are almost 100 percent transient effective flops. No problem. But the challenge is, when that's not the case. After all, discovery doesn't happen in a cache line. When it's supposed to be in something you didn't know, it's probably around the globe, the two data items, right? So, therefore, the efficiency drops like a rock. When you're dealing with irregular access patterns and complex functions underneath sparse solve, and it's happening even in HPC, that's why you see benchmarks like HPC GM Graph 500, efficiency there is one-tenth of uh, dense al algebra, probably even lower, right? Significantly lower. So that's really the challenge. If they share similarity, they also share the challenges in how we design machines for it. So, uh, 
like I said, the hard part being irregular access patterns. Otherwise, it's it's all good, and you can actually deal with the dense part and much easier and deliver the same as we have done for machine learning. So now let's again emphasize an important point that when you look at uh, uh, these machine learning applications, the kind you see here, traditionally our uh, we have mapped our applications into these two extreme buckets. Meaning, if they're both data stru data structure traversal heavy, we call them the database type, and if they're really numeric computing ha heavy, they have become our no favorite uh, traditional HPC apps. Machine learning and graph, uh, graph analytics are somewhere in between, meaning they have significant amount of that numeric goodness, but they also have large portion, significant amount of complex data structure traversal. And if you figure this out, then you get rewarded by actually spending most of your time in these nice algebra routines, right? So it's, it's, it's beautiful in the sense that it does kind of cover that spectrum. And therefore, the point being that it's, uh, if, if you're, a typical machine learning application needs all of this, both numeric competition and complex data structure traversal supported efficiently. If you think of building some cool uh, accelerator offload a portion, that kind of offloading of a portion of computer graph processor, for example, doesn't work because it still needs to do other things which are very different. So you need to truly deliver a general purpose processor which can do both of these types of computations. So uh, with this uh, uh, background, uh, now let me just again emphasize that we will be focusing on this one uh, primary class of algorithms, namely machine learning, and, uh, and we'll uh, do our deep dive. So uh, before uh, we dig deeper though, uh, and now that we are roughly through maybe a third of the talk, let me preview the key messages for rest of my talk, rest of my presentation, so that you have reasons to hang around. So, uh, <laughs> Machine learning, but hopefully by this time I've convinced you that machine learning is the most significant emerging algorithm class today, right, for the promise it offers. But now, quote unquote bad news, because of the complexity I was just alluding to, it's also true, and the fact that it's an emerging class of algorithms, it's also true that publicly available code for machine learning is highly inefficient. I couldn't overemphasize highly inefficient, right, especially in terms of its primarily because of its parallelism unawareness, right? So what we have done therefore is what we really need to do is code modernization, something that we, again, the HPC world has been happening quite uh, quite a bit over the last few years. So what we have done therefore is what we, like I said, what we always do, namely figure out the right algorithm, and that's where the real 100x, 1000x happens, after that you only lose. So figure out the right algorithm, and then map it in the most optimal way, meaning in a parallelism aware sense. Parallelism at all dimensions, cores, threads, SMD, boost the locality for caches, avoid communication, do all those good things. And when you do all this, yes, you get very, very high performance. High in the sense, uh, 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 and, and when we've done that, we've not just done this for at a single node level, because again, big data by definition doesn't happen on a node. It happens on multi nodes. So what we are going to be showing you here, performance, optimized performance at node level, at distributed processing platform level for both Xeon and Xeon Phi. And uh, the, uh, 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 like I said, the net result is that we have achieved very high performance and efficiency, leadership performance and efficiency, sometimes multiple orders of magnitude better than the, C, the uh, publicly available current CPU code, the best publicly available current CPU code performance to date. And we keep going in this optimization, not because we have exceeded a, a performance by 10x or 100x, we keep going till we achieve a certain level of efficiency that we believe we should be getting on architecture, from our architecture. That's when we pause. And when we pause, often by then, we figure out, oh, we have gone significantly past this uh, other CPU codes or uh, quote unquote. Not only that, we have also significantly exceeded in most cases, 90 plus percent of the cases, probably 99 percent of the cases, quote unquote special purpose offload accelerators like GPUs. Now remember, these offload processors have their own software overhead, coding model, offload. How do you offload over a uh, uh, big data over a PCIe, for example, right? So, but, so they're all kinds of challenges and so net gain, net, uh, net net is that we have exceeded performance not just on our own CPUs but also over special purpose offload processors and then uh, typically we would uh, write all this up but no in, in, uh, and, and some research papers that you have to read and understand no what we are going to do is make it really simple for you all of this is packaged nicely in our routines in our in our libraries that you are very well familiar with MKL DAL all this will be packaged and delivered to you such that the barrier to you is significantly lower for realizing this performance gain. So then, 
let me uh, tell you that, that, like I said, this this is not something we have done. We are done with. No, this will continue. Both processor roadmap and, and tool chain will be enhanced to support this. And yeah, all this, even though I s sound excited, hopefully, uh, all this is still probably doesn't is not quite enough to give you a feel for the excitement that we truly feel uh, about machine learning. So to make it even better. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored and proud to actually uh, let you know that in this session, for the very first time, you, you'll be seeing a workload level performance disclosure of Xeon Phi Nights Landing, an HPC processor. But the first performance disclosure is not HPC, but machine learning. The very first workload level performance disclosure. And we, uh, we expect it to definitely set a new high bar for machine learning, so stay tuned. <laughs> oh, where's my fancy animation? Yes. <laughs> okay, it looks good, right? A lot of hard work went into that animation, trust me. Okay, so uh, again, the most important point, and this I have to re-emphasize, is that Intel toolchain, Intel has a, a toolchain for supporting machine learning, and it's more than what we've just been talking about. We'll be mostly covering MQL that you're very well familiar with, and DAL, that's the new uh, 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 data analytics library between MQL and DAL. Xeon, Xeon 5 machine learning, single node level, multi node level, all gets covered, right? And I'll be pointing you to tech sessions where they get covered in more detail. But this more than that, right? This Intel Analytics Toolkit and the newest uh, entry in this uh, in this uh, space, Discovery Peak, an open source platform. You can hear and learn more about those things in the tech sessions. I'll be pointing to the uh, towards the end. Okay. So now the deep dive time, right? So what we have done here is again. Went, uh, went out and carefully selected, uh, picked a representative enough suite of machine learning. We didn't just focus on something which was the most popular. If machine learning is popular, there's something popular inside machine learning. Probably, you know, deep learning. So we didn't just pick one and focus only there. We still had to do due diligence to the entire space of machine learning. So we picked, and we also picked non-trivial examples. So we didn't pick simple ones where you can, we can I can show you a fantastic efficiency. We picked reasonably complex ones so that you have a feel for the spectrum of machine learning uh, problems. And when we claim efficiency, we you actually get a feel that we are claiming it broadly enough, right? And everything you see here again is available in MQL DAL now, or will soon be available. The only item soon be available is that red deep learning box. Right, and I'll be sharing a timeline with you uh, towards the end of this presentation. So, now let's start with the most simplest of all. Again, unsupervised learning, that exactly the kind we want and k-means, right? So now, let's look at uh, clustering, right? Clustering is the very uh, simplest of all in some sense, right? Unsupervised learning problem, and it's one of the top 10 machine learning algorithms for a long time. All you do is you have un unlabeled data and you're trying to find groups inside it which are similar to each other and dissimilar from uh, from the other groups based on some distance measure. So for this uh, simple enough problem, again, what we did again is went out and looked the best published result and, and made sure that we were able to match the parameters such that we can compare. I mean, we have no our reason to pick these whatever parameters you see there, dimension of 784 or uh, number of means being there. We, picked a public data set, 8 million uh, um, MNIST data set, match everything. And again, to just make it, make, uh, show you the point, this is single node Xeon Haswell, single node, more than a year old processor, and delivering uh, three x better performance on one side, when a number of means equal to 256, than the best published G GPU result, and more than 100 times better on this other side, when the number of means is 4096, than a spark based CPU cluster. The point simply being that it's not a platform, CPU, 100 node, or GPU, uh, whichever, right, 6 teraflop. It's what's really at the heart is doing, understanding the algorithm and doing it right. And when you do that, the gains on the platform you have is very, very pre uh, uh, surprisingly good, okay? To the point where it really exceeds everything that's out there. And we didn't, again, we don't stop just at k-means, because even though it's a nice library function, we work with real practitioners to actually understand clustering in a real application context, because that's how it ultimately gets used. So in this specific case, we, uh, we were given a data set where we could not simply apply k-means because a very complex data set, a real cosmology data set, a very large data set, 1.4 trillion particle, trillion particle data set. And the cluster series are not the nice elliptic ones which happens typically when you have a Gaussian process underneath. In this case, some very complex processes, very random shape kernel, uh, random shape uh, uh, clusters. And that's a real problem. In this context, we pick the right algorithm in density-based clustering and 
There's no way for it to ever fit on one node, of course. Not only that, we need to scale it to the supercomputers of the world. And working in, uh, with Lawrence Berkeley Lab, we use them to scale it to 100,000 cores, right? And the net result, we have achieved performance on a trillion particle data set, something which is two, three orders of magnitude when it was last tried a few years back on some other uh, GPU supercomputer. Two, three orders of magnitude over a speed up. More importantly, we are now able to do in real time a, 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 Iterate through this 1.4 trillion particle data set such that scientists are now happy and they can see things that they never saw before. So, continuing our deep dive, we have done two forms of, you showed you two forms of clustering. Now, let's go on to something that's not quite supervised and supervised learning, but it's made popular, it's been made popular recently by the quote unquote Netflix challenge collaborative filtering, right? Now, so what is collaborative filtering? Something, let me uh, see if. Uh, the, this Wikipedia image can help uh, me explain this. It's very simple, right? We have millions of people, millions of movies, right? Uh, billions of people, millions of movies. And you're trying to recommend a movie to a certain uh, individual, looking at, and the individual hasn't seen yet, but you're going by likes and dislikes of other individuals and trying to find who this guy is similar to so that I can use the other guy's likes and dislikes for this guy, right? That's what the, at, the, at the highest level is. And when does it work? It, and why does it work? It works primarily based on this assumption that even though the, we are billions of people, we are not billion types of people, we are only few types of people, right? Good guys, bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> even though there are millions of movies, they are not millions of movies, million types of movies, they are probably very few types of movies, horror movies, comedy movies, whatever. Let's see, actually there are only two. So then this large matrix that we are talking about, millions and billions, can actually be decomposed into just two rows, two column matrices. Now that, the, this decomposition is really what the heart, at the heart of this is, right? And that's solving this problem on the other hand is, even though theory is known, it, the algorithms used are quite not, not easy to parallelize. There's, there, uh, in, in many ways, uh, the uh, most common one is stochastic gradient descent, again, hard to parallelize, right? This is an alternate way of doing uh, ALS, and we covered in another session I'm pointing you to. What we picked here is stochastic gradient descent, again, because it's challenging, right? It's challenging to parallelize. The most Common, the most popular algorithm for it, Hogwild, right? Even though it's hype of the best performant, doesn't quite scale, right? Doesn't quite scale. So what we have is a uh, we uh, looked at a partition scheme, which goes and a part adds, discovers, uh, uh, somehow exposes more dimensions of parallelism, makes the scaling better, both within node and multi node. For the first time, you're seeing Hogwild is uh, sorry, uh, collaborative filtering scaling uh, based on SGD to tens of nodes. So far, the scaling has been very difficult even just, just to single digit nodes. So we are showing results here all the way to 64 nodes. Communication cost is kept manageable, right? Only goes up by two, three X, and therefore this uh, net net, you have a decent scaling all the way to 64 nodes. The work is not done, it's continuing, but you see some exciting result here on a stochastic gradient descent based for a collaborative filtering, both single node and multi node. So now we move on to uh, uh, supervised learning, the most common form of learning. And again, uh, let's uh, look at uh, uh, classification, right? The uh, um, uh, important problem, uh, and 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 we by design we're picking again something not a simple regression like linear regression. Let's pick something a little more complex, right? That's uh, the theme in the stock. So we pick logistic regression based classification. What happens here? It's it's. Uh, something like this, right? So imagine again uh, uh, trying to find. <coughs> Uh, a, a, a pro imagine again a process where there are many parameters. At the end of the day, you're trying to predict something, just some categories, right? So based on all kinds of parameters, you're trying to predict whether whether a patient will survive or die. In fact, it's a very challenging problem we're working with with our science and technologists in at MIT with the mimic data set, right? Predicting patient mortality, super challenging problem. But such things, at the end of the day, is just is the guy going to survive or die? Very simple output, but very complex output. You have to look at the guy's life history and, 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 and all the data, medical data to be able to do the prediction right. So, and it's not typically just two classes, it could be multiple classes. Imagine being able to predict uh, uh, the 100 face uh, die, right? Which, uh, it's output. So the outputs are categor categories that you'll be predicting and the reason it calls a little bit confusing uh, uh, regression is because you don't just predict the class, you also predict the probability associated, the confidence level associated with that class. So that's how it becomes a continuous function. So uh, what we are showing here is a simple example, cats and dogs. 
right? So if underlying process is a uh, has a, a Bernoulli distribution, you typically get this, right? If it was a nice binomial process that was generating it, you'll get nice elliptic shapes. But that's what happens. Many processes, the generative process, are not binomial, uh, not but not Gaussian, but Bernoulli, and that's when you see this. So what happens here? Again, we take the hard problem, multi-class logistic regression, went out, did our due diligence, and found the best performing code, right? And the same theme repeats. This is the theme you'll hear over and over again. That yes, once we understood, analyzed, performed, and again, we, I'm showing you here the Sandwich number only because that's how we could do an apple to apple comparison, right? So Sandwich has to pick all the right, right uh, hardware platforms, did the most apple to apple. 60 times faster than the best published CPU result and also faster than best published GPU result, right? Now, clearly, the, uh, the, uh, uh, at least the GPU in this case has significantly more flops and bandwidth, right? So the point is not, again, flops and bandwidth, is how efficiently you can utilize them. Do you understand the algorithm and you're doing it right? When you do it right, scaling and performance on single node exceeds, far exceeds anything that's out there. So continuing now, to now let's pick something even harder. So again, those kind of, uh, uh, squiggly curve, but now let's take something even uglier. The only good thing with this ugly part is that there is uh, a trick, a trick that was published in 1992 by a famous guy, um, um, now works for Facebook, so, uh, who created uh, this, uh, this quote-unquote kernel trick, where you use this kernel trick and map into a higher dimension, and now there's a, the, the data is lin linearly separable. Beautiful, right? Now, whenever it, wo when it works, fantastic, very powerful. In fact, till, the, uh, uh, till deep learning became popular, this was the trick talked about most support vector machine was all over, right? And where people were building support vector machine processors, just like deep learning processors. Now, by the time the process design is over, the <laughs> technique is in place. Right? That's the whole power of John Powell's computing, right? So, uh, support vector machine again, because it's probably the most popular technique for a long time, like up until recently, it was easy for us, easier for us to actually go out and find the most types of coding efforts done, right? In fact, this was the very first technique which was ported to GPU and the GPU being GTX 8800, very, very old, one of the earliest GPU, GPU attempts. But the work was so good that it actually made it to the tier one machine learning conference, ICML. So, the, so we picked all such codes, right? And we, LibSVM is the most popular one used for CPU and there are three flavors of GPU codes. And we picked them all. We literally Google and find and the, pick the best anything that's out there. And these are all popular codes because many people I can see comments and downloading and using this. And what do we learn? Same thing, right? Performance is all over. And this is the only place in my entire presentation that the y-axis is log 10. Right? So you can see how you can make any point you want. You can brag your platform, you can brag an algorithm, you can brag a data set for all that matters. But the performance is all over. Point being that the code whether CPU, GPU is, is as much in the need of optimization, right? And if you simply pick a code, your performance can be 10 to 1,000 times off, right? So what do you do again? We understand the same thing that we always do. Understand that code, understand the algorithm, do it right. When you do it right, the poor old Haswell beats them all. Almost beats them all across the board, right? So the most stable performance on the last set of bars, right? Maybe 10, 20 percent off in some case, and we are showing it, right? But Look at the flop and efficiency and the portability of the code, right? So that's what we did and same thing, same conclusion repeats. So now let's move on to the most exciting part, right? The exciting part, at least if you believe press, deep learning. Now why is deep learning so exciting? Because let's understand, I mean, there's good reason, right? Everything we've done so far can be called in some sense, strictly speaking, uh, technical terms, shallow learning. Why? Because ultimately you're figuring out this one hidden layer, right? That's why shallow, right? So input gets transformed to output with some trick, right? The trick would be powerful kernel trick, but what is the trick is this shallow learning where there's only one hidden layer, right? Now, that's not always possible, right? If the function that you're trying to learn is complex, like non-convex shape of my face, right? All kinds of curves here, it's very difficult to learn those shapes, right? These functions are non-convex, very hard to learn, and hard to learn in the sense that you, uh, in principle, you can learn through one layer of transformation. But that one layer would need to have exponential number of compute. On the other hand, if you're looking at it, if you can actually map it to a deeper representation, then you can do the same learning but with polynomial number of compute. That's the fundamental theorem that excites everyone. That it's actually feasible to learn a deeper representation implemented because the compute requirement is polynomial non-exponential. If you could learn a deep representation, but training and learning a deep representation has been the hard problem. That's why it's not been practiced up until now. 
So now let's look at, therefore, this interesting deep learning and where it has been shown to be very effective, the most popular place being ImageNet, right? Learning images, finding cats and dogs, right? Again, with huge amount of label data, that uh, a, a heroic attempt done by uh, our professors we work with very closely, uh, Fei and Kylie, created this 1K label data with Amazon Mechanical Turks. And deep learning has been shown to be very effective for this. Effective to the point is actually beating human accuracy levels. Right? So, what is happening? Right? Why is it doing, like I said, uh, 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 so well and how? So, let's again look at a little bit uh, deep learning in action, a little slowly. Right? So, deep learning in action is something like this, meaning you input large number of images. Right? In this case, they are all images of dog. Right? My daughter loves dogs, not me, I run away. Uh, and these are all very complex images of dogs, right? They all look dogs to us, right? And to any kid will easily spot them all as dog. But look at those images. They're not simple, nice, affine transformation that we know how to deal with in graphics, right? We know how to deal with those. Rotate, translate, whatever. These are very, very non-linear, non-affine transformations, right? And they're still very much a dog, right? But to technically describe those two as still dog is very, very hard problem. And therefore, if we can actually figure this out and train a deep enough network to do this right, powerful, right? And that's what happened with enough such training data. When you first feed in, you get some garbage out because the network is not trained. It tells you a fly could have told you uh, Madonna, doesn't matter, right? Some garbage. You look at the, and since it's trained data, labeled data, you know exactly what this image is. So you propagate the difference between that output, the garbage output like fly and dog, the right output, back. That's the back propagation. You adjust all the weights such that next time around, the network is more likely to say dog than some random not incorrect output. This process goes on and on and on till you reach a good enough level of accuracy on some test data set, right? So that's what deep learning is. And the power of it is this art of how do I, what is the right feature, what's the right metric of to be looking at, what are my top components, the UPC and such things. You don't have no such human involvement in, in giving you the right feature set to distinguish out. The nose is the real distinction for separating between humans. I don't need to know that. The feature set, the feature engineering is not a human art here. It's automatically learned. That's the whole power of deep learning. And you see actually it's very meaningful representation, meaningful hierarchy representation. Why? Because you can see that as you go deeper and deeper in the network, you actually begin to see a cartoonish image of a dog. That's how we actually look at people. When we look at someone, we kind of remember, you can look at me and say, you may not remember the gory details about me, but you, ah, it looks like some Indian, right? And that's it, that's the image you carry in your head, right? <laughs> After you know me for a while, you can almost write an equation for me, but maybe never, right? But so what, you can still begin to predict, this guy has to talk fast, he looks there, and all those things you immediately predict, right? So, because you have an image, that's how we understand and remember people, right? Over time, we get better and better, you can probably begin to predict all my hand movements, right? After, towards the end of the talk, but, Initially, you don't. You have a coarse representation. So as you go deeper and deeper, you actually have it's a hierarchical representation that the system automatically learned. That's the whole power of deep learning. So uh, now let's uh, talk about uh, what happens here, right? So uh, again, what we did is like I told you, what we uh, always do: we go out and challenge ourselves. And this was this one was easier to get challenged. Why? Because the challenge is already out there, right? People are competing in this challenge, namely ImageNet. So, we just picked the last two, three years of winner topologies. These are called network topologies that have won in the last two, three years, like in fact, 12, 13, 14. AlexNet, Go, FeedFast, and, and VGGA, right? And for those complex enough network topologies, we optimize. And again, the goodness here is that there is actually a core library that can be uh, created again because the same sort of function that keep repeating. And that's what we are uh, uh, taking in and, and putting it in MKL. So that once we did the job right, we were able to use the same core compute optimized functions across the board here for different network topologies. And each case, we, we are getting performance significantly above, many times more than public level code. Public level code again for the reasons sometimes have to, sometimes have to do with framework, sometimes have to do with not being able to use our tools right, or the tools themselves, libraries themselves, missing key functions, all those reasons. But the net net is that when we do it right, we see very significant performance gain for the, all the complex topologies that we know of. And when this happens, especially because here we are talking classification, so we already have a trained model somehow and all we care about is this throughput of classification. Since 
We are talking here throughput efficiency matters. And, and, and you really have a, a task that you would probably keep repeating forever. If you have a well-trained model, you probably never train it again. You just keep classifying the rest of your, li rest of your life. Doesn't happen often, but what, when that happens, the efficiency is all that matters. Time, not time to train doesn't matter. You already have a train model. All you care about at what rate you can cycle through it, right? So anytime efficiency is the uh, uh, a primary uh, metric, we are, even though we love Xeon, it's the hardest thing to beat, right? We do look for what is the right thing from the workload point of view to accelerate. Can this be made even better, right? So we look for, and, and by any metric, and this is how Xeon 5 was created. For HPC, we found that they can, they can be productive, pro productively offloaded. At least the compute kernels which didn't have such big data to be you know, transferred over PCIe. We could productively offload them and net net speed, still speed up an application. That's why we created a coprocessor card, Knight's Corner for Xeon 5 and the whole line today, right? Of course, so we know the art. We tried the same again. We would have loved if the same thing worked here, right? But unfortunately, it's very challenging because of the simple reasons. They are complex functions. They come with complex data. Offloading and still delivering and speed up overall for the application is non-trivial, right? But on the other hand, something that we really understood very well. I said, how about this one? This one we really understand. We can have super efficient implementations. So in this specific case, when we tried that, we were not quite uh, uh, happy with the performance, but we are very happy with the performance, energy performance. Which does matter in this case, right? Images per second, not just that. Images per second per watt, like I said, right? So on that efficiency metric, we were able to successfully and productively offload to something exciting. Exciting as in what? Let me share that excitement with you, right? So this is the one time you'll see in my presentation, FPGA, yes, we were able to use FPGA platform from Altera and Efficiency, performance is one thing, but more importantly, the efficiency, which is per second per watt, for again, all the disclosures here on everything, right, AlexNet, for CNN classification, power path, boosted by more than 2x, 9 plus 9.27 images, images per second per watt measure per, uh, power data, right, at least the, all the Xeon memory uh, host everything. Now, this 9 images per second per watt, again, is leadership, right, there's no publication out there claiming on any platform this energy efficiency for doing something that we otherwise understand very well. And in, in a way, it's very simple, right? Images uh, uh, seen in classification, right? So, power performance improved by over 2x when you bring, if the metric of goodness is energy efficiency and not just performance and not just for machine learning in general, but for this specific function, right? And choice is yours. Now, moving on, as I said, the, the real challenge is not classification. That's in fact, we would want to be only doing classification. The real challenge is training, right? Training, how do we train a model that's good enough so that we can then spend all our time in classification, which can even be done in lower precision, right? 32 bit, 16 bit, even lower. So it's beautiful, I mean, it's, it's totally figured out. I mean, if all that matters is classification, we can probably build a real CNN processor and then maybe the, the deep learning goes out the door and then we will throw in the processor. But you can actually do it. We know how to do it, right? Now, the point is that the hard problem is training. So, we always challenge ourselves. We sign up for the hardest problem so that we can go brag on the uh, number one uh, conferences in the world and win Gordon Bells and whichever awards which we have we tried and we keep. Actually, last year we had a Best Paper Award nomination, Gordon Bell nomination, prior to that we did win Gordon Bell. Sorry, Best Paper Award. So, we do and always constantly brag and challenge ourselves, right? To the tier one, the work uh, conferences around the globe. So in this case, again, this being the hardest problem, we, again, we, of course, significantly sped up our hash code, right? Significantly in the sense, this is the only time you'll see speed up numbers, uh, that whatever that, uh, uh, the cafe integrated public code that everyone uses, this is 14 times better once we did the optimization. Why is this important? It's important for one reason, because you've probably uh, seen uh, public press showing up GPS 15x, 10x, 20x, 17x, better than CPU for doing Alex Knight training. Okay. That 14, 15x doesn't mean go buy a new card. It just means please just check it, check your code, and you can get the 14x from the machine you have, right? Right there. No need to go anywhere. No need to offer. No need to learn anything. Right there, you get the 14x, right? And of course, that's still just a meaningless bragging thing because who does training on uh, one node, right? But if that's this, that's a good start still, right? And the beauty of what we are talking about here is when we do this code investment, software engineering, which is significant amount of work, right? 
we definitely want that investment amortized over space and time. Meaning machines, other machines in the time frame and over time. And that is how, that's why we can said the transformations that we're putting in are not specific to a cash line site. So they get thrown away with the cash line site status. They're friendly to cashes, period, the locality. We boost localities, not a specific cash size. We boost SIMD friendliness, not a specific SIMD width. So when we boost data parallelism, cache awareness, locality awareness rather, communication avoidance, those are all gen high level general tricks when we invest time there. Over time we know, we know that data parallelism is going to go, we know communication is not going to grow for anyone, that those problems are hard. So that investment is what makes the code very portable over time. Okay, and like I said, portable not over time, the best proof here is not portable just over the line of Xeon, portable in general for the right C for the CPU models. And we now have something called Xeon Phi, new Xeon Phi Knights Landing, which actually shares that fundamental compute model. It's also not a no offload anymore, for the reasons I told you on our learnings with offload. It's a processor just like the other one. So all our code, our learning, our training, our scaling, all codes nicely, right? We don't have to figure out which um, magic function to offload. So that in investment preserved. It's just one is for parallel workloads, one is for higher, highly parallel workloads. When you have higher parallelism that you can trade off single set performance, you use this. Otherwise, don't. So when you do that, we in this is the case. So this is the one you have been. I've been. Uh, I gave you a reason to hold on to your seats. Yes, the same code. That beautiful code gives you another two x right out of the box, right? A nice landing, right? Now again, this is our silicon-based projection, not simulated or spreadsheet or anything, right? Silicon-based projection. And of course, it's not done yet, right? So it's showing you a bar, right? Lower bar, higher bar. And trust me, the both bars are improving over time. We haven't paused either one of those. The both bars keep going higher, okay? So the work is still continuing, but where it is already now, right? It's already giving, preserving our software investment, awarding us, rewarding us for doing the job right for Xeon. That's the power of doing it right, figuring it out right, and keeping the compute model more or less untouched, right? Unless it really needs to change. We haven't seen a reason for it, right? So again, but like I said, it's still, it's the, only the easy part of the problem, right? It's the toy part of the problem. This problem really, the real challenge has been multi-node scaling, right? If we could scale like that, we can go to the clouds of the world, right? That's multi-node scaling is very hard here. Why? Because large amount of weights get updated. That whole data, all of these, that communication really chokes you, right? Anytime you go into, into node. So that's what we did next. We signed up for that, figure that out, some secret sauce. Once we figured out and scaled it, so so far the best you see for multi-node is just only a uh, few, four node, eight node. And each node is packed with eight or 10 GPU cards. So eight nodes, eight cards, 64 cards, right? Custom supercomputer, why? Because custom interconnect, right? So somehow you build a custom appliance to reach a certain level of performance. Why? Because multi-node scaling is hard. So we figured that out, we figured this problem, we signed up for this challenge and which we'll be publishing soon. And the net net, again, the, the, our, my, our favorite Haswell scales now beautifully, not just to one to four node, which was it, which itself has been a challenge, all the way to 64 nodes. And again, we haven't done, we are not done yet. This scaling will go on. We have tricks not yet implemented to hundreds of nodes, right? So we have solved again the hardest scaling problem here and that Haswell itself, not only single node, multi-node, it scales down to for this. And now again, we are re revealing all these details because typically these performance numbers are very hard to compare. People will make a claim, I can train 100 times faster on some something somewhere. But how do we compare the performance? It's very hard. So we are trying to change that. We're setting a new standard again, disclosing all details so that that comparison becomes possible. And we have done our due diligence, reading all these papers, trying to figure out how uh, uh, what the performance has been. And we have therefore, we, we can confidently claim that the Haswell itself Getting down to uh, eight hours of training time on a topology like uh, topology like overfit fast is a, is a record, right? So again, on that same Haswell, multi-node Haswell, not a custom interconnect, it's commodity everything, it scales beautifully to deliver the best time to train, right? And again, of course, it doesn't stop with the same story repeats, right? And when you actually take that to night's landing. Because it's not a PCI-based co-processor that we have to fight new challenges to scale. It's the same thing, 
right? Same Xeon replaced by Xeon Phi. Everything else remains the same. Same socket build, bootable processor. So the same scaling that we get here, we get there. Point being, you benefit from the investment you made in that scaling, net net. We're now down to three to four hours unheard of performance, right? Again, we're not stopping here. Why? Because this challenge itself is a toy challenge. Imagine it, one camera. Imagine, imagine that category should be. We all have more than thousand categories of images that we can see, right? So the next one is 22 k I mean, that is not hard enough. Look at uh, uh, speech problem, word out with a million words in a dictionary. So the, this com complexity of doing this will only keep growing. So we're looking at now trillions of parameters, very, very bad on actual neural nets. How do we scale them to not just hundred? Thousands, and we'll soon be again have an uh, uh, ISRA, a public a public call going out for deep learning to engage academics, so they can be challenged to take it places it has never ever gone there. So we're not talking <laughs> winning image with eight cards or eight notes. We're talking solving real hard complex problems on very very large machines, very very large systems, supercomputers of the world, everything fair game. Not only that, we also look at the scaling itself. So it becomes really easy in the commodity environment clouds or uh, clusters, so you can have very high performance at a very low affordable cost. So you can again, now, uh, like I said, you can see how the performance and the data we have shared with you itself sets a new record and gives us high enough confidence that we are actually sharing these projections with you before we have launched it and before you have seen lint back performance on HPC processor, you are actually seeing this. Now this should give an empirical feel for what I was earlier talking about. I was giving you technical reasons for how HPC and machine learning are related. Empirical evidence is right there. Something designed for something else is actually del delivering leadership performance for something else. That's why these two things are really related really and similar. Proof is in front of you. So now, moving on. Now that you've seen a preview of our uh, roadmap and our hardware capabilities, now let's look at, like I said, everything we've talked about so far. Typically, in our uh, old days, uh, we published all this at uh, those supercomputing government machine learning type conferences and then say, oh, here's my cool paper, read it and you'll be super happy. No, we're not doing that here. Yes, you can still go read our papers, but you don't really have to because if all that goodness is being packaged in the diamonds you love, like MKL, this thing that you're only familiar with. So we take care of over time, scaling it, scaling the performance on whichever backends we have and you can relax because it's actually doable here, just like HPC, the core functions are very few. So if we simply go and take care of those, you'll be happy in dealing with your uh, natural language processing or your Chef Watson-like applications because of the hard, we're talking the functions that we understand the most and we can scale them so that they move with technology. That's the whole bottom line. You want the implementations to effort to be preserved and that can only be preserved when they move with technology, with the dimensions of technology. Then some are scaling beautifully, some are not. When you have that consciousness built in, your algorithmic investment, your coding investment will be preserved. That's what we're trying to do for MKL, through MKL and DAL. And you can see a very detailed timeline disclosure here, right? Not just what we have now, but what will be disclosed, what will be delivering before the year ends and early next year, through the next year. And you can clearly see for both Xeon and Xeon Phi, everything you've seen so far, through MKL DAL, single node, distributed node, Deep learning also to be supported. Not only that, we didn't stop there either. Also cafe integration, knowing it's a very popular framework, that integration as well. So technology TV coming up soon and then productization of it. Based on the, again, the libraries that we came up with in research, it's the same thing we've always been doing. Move technology transfer, the things that we learned for sparse solve, for Linpack, for other things, in this case, it's machine learning, right? Now, so this is really, now it's time to sum it up. So the summary here is rather uh, simple. Hopefully you can sum it up. Yes, machine learning is the most significant emerging algorithm class today. And uh, uh, publicly available code, yes, it's highly inefficient because it's parallelism unaware, right? Not something surprising because it's a new area and, and, it's, and these functions are complex, more complex than these are dense uh, length back. So code modernization is the key. And we are, and, and it will deliver very, pleasing performance, high efficiency, high portability, and high productivity. Why? Because it'll all be, it's all being made, made available to you through the tool chain you're familiar with, right? And the net result is leadership performance and efficiency for these functions that exceeds whatever you're seeing currently, and not just on our own CPUs, but also on quote unquote special purpose off-road processes. And upcoming enhancements to our hardware roadmap and tool chain 
will act because it's a rapidly evolving workload space, right? We're not just focusing on, that's why I showed you a whole lot more than deep learning. And, and even that entire space, tomorrow they would be, probably there will be a new algorithm class, a new type of machine learning algorithm. We'll be looking at that as well. We already have our eyes on reinforcement learning, for example, right? So such this rapidly evolving field, we will preserve, we'll take care of that by constantly finding the core routines in there, optimizing them to move a technology. So, and, and like I said, Intel Xeon 5 processor Knight's Landing is about to set a new high bar for machine learning in the industry. And uh, again, uh, the call to action, yes, let's together take machine learning performance to new heights because it's so powerful. It has the potential to really change and take computing where it's never gone before. Take computing where computing only exists for those guys in health, farming, education, whatever computing exists only for the emails. Let's change that. We have the power to actually bring computing to those hard problems, right? Because they are very hard, very complex problems, very hard decision-making problems. We can actually take computing to that next level where we really have almost like what can be better. I mean, nothing can be better than actually creating a machine that's smarter than its creator. It's the ultimate dream. And that's what we really have to select together, grow the use of machine learning and turn this big data into a real uh, prescriptive analytics and actionable recommendations. So, uh, and again, even though we have shared all kinds of bragging performance data, we are very fully aware and cognizant that yes, this rapidly evolving field, quite likely you know something even better, even higher performing, we'd love to hear from you. That's why I, have, I had my email there, they took it out, it's a nice blog there, you can go comment there, feel free to send, my, send me an email, my first name dot last name at intel.com, love to hear from you. If you know of something even better, even more exciting, or then we have what we have shown you here, happy to work with you, sign up for your challenge, however you want. And, and, and like I said, let's grow the use and, and of machine learning and we truly believe the Intel architecture is the efficient, performant and the most productive platform for doing this, for doing machine learning. So all those text sessions that I talked about will be in your PDF, you can please attend these, as many of these as you can, because they'll fill up, the, they'll cover the spectrum that I could not cover for you. And finally, fill out something, online session. Um, you compared Spark and um, uh, I think Night's Landing. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember what the comparison performance was. The Spark was. comparison was for the, uh, not, there's no Night's Landing in there. I can go back to it. So there are there two places that should have been some, uh, I think one was K-means, other was some stochastic gradient descent. Uh -huh. So, think, so we are implemented on a single node as well, and we are comparing with the public domain. Okay. No, that was that, uh, my question really is: is it training or prediction uh, performance in that case? So, no, this was again. You can, so, in one case, it's K-means, right? Mm -hmm. so it's just K-means clustering for a dimension size of 784. Yeah, there's no model there. Yeah. Yes. So, and the other one I'm forgetting, but the, all the parameters are there. And the Spark examples, I think, uh, the K-means is the one I remember. Just simply K-means. Okay. And uh, last question. Um, you also had um, a comparison with uh, performance power. Yes. Right? So one that's case. the total package if you were to compare yes. things. Yes. Um, for training, you recommend then uh, use something either a Xeon or a nice landing, whereas for prediction, use FPGAs with it? So, so Xeon clearly is good for both, right? But when time to train really matters, you can speed it up with nice landing. And when time, and, and that's what really is a goodness metric in, in training. For classification, the goodness matrix is not time to train. There's no training yet, but it's really efficiency with which you can actually cycle through the documents or images. So if you really want higher efficiency and you all set on the doing one type of classification, namely CNN, whichever, then we recommend, we have seen that FPGAs can actually speed up the efficiency, energy performance for the classification task, at least the one we looked at. <clears throat> but Xeon, again, the, the competition for all of these processors is really the Xeon. I mean, the Knight's Landing's biggest challenge is its own cousin Xeon, right? And that's what we see over and over again, right? And yes, there are pro points, that's why we showed you where we can exceed Xeon performance or efficiency. Your metric of goodness, your metrics could be efficiency in terms of program productivity. That's a very different metric, we haven't looked at it. Whatever your metric of goodness is, it's possible to justify something else. We look for those things. Yeah, I have two questions for you. Uh, one is that, can you comment on the compute to communication ratio when you used Xeon with the Xeon uh, Knight's Landing? 
Second question is that, can you also comment on what did you get out of the box versus the tuned? So the tuning is a, also an investment. So basically, yes. uh, how much time you spend on tuning the code to in order to get a uh, harness a performance. Exactly. So that's why I was showing you this one. In fact, I emphasize that part that the ninth learning performance we show as two bars. The first bar is really what we more or less get, quote unquote, out of the box, right? And and then the tuning is happening because it's like I said, it's not done. That's why the higher bar keeps going up also. That's ninth learning specific tuning because of its MC DRAM and such features. But the good part of it is that the Xeon coding investment at single node was preserved to give us that first bar. From multi node, so far that's all we've done. We haven't done anything that's, we probably don't expect to be doing anything. The question you asked earlier, compute communication ratio is very challenging in this case, right? But the good thing is that the tricks we figure out for Xeon apply to Xeon Phi as well. Because the same, it's not uh, going through more hops, it's the same socketable solution. So that's the whole point that, so to answer your two questions, yes, com computer communication is challenging for deep learning training. We have understood it, we have tackled it, and we'll be publishing details. And it, that trick, the technique applies to both Xeon and Xeon Phi. Same thing here, the out of the box performance for Xeon Phi, night's learning is what we are more proud of, trust me. And then, of course, tuning will further improve and probably will keep happening. But that's, you need to decide whether 2x is good enough or you will need 3.2x. If it's a competition, you need the every x you can get. Hi. Um, on the FPGA implementation, uh, did you use a QPI attached FPGA or a PCI attached? It's PCI attached. And, and, and by the way, the FPGA work was done in collaboration with Altera. In fact, they are the experts in, in this. So we worked with them. 